What I want to do now is I want to return to these ideas of design, which uh, I brought up earlier in these videos, as another interpretive take on what's going on in these, these images. So I see the world, right? But the world is only seeable um, because I've had these other experiences of the world. So the available designs in this sense are the things that I've seen in the world, the mountains that I've seen, the Eiffel Towers that I've seen, uh, the way in which I've classified towers in the world, the way in which I've classified mountains. I understand what their criterial features are. I have a whole pile of mental images based on my experience. And then what I do in the seeing process is I design that meaning. That meaning is not there in the picture or in the scene. I actively make that meaning because I'm looking for things which relate to my previous historical experience uh, of imaging in the world. And then what I might do is the redesigned is either a mental image that I go away with, which is I've actively reprocessed the scene that I've seen, or I've actively remembered that painting that I saw in the gallery, which was a really nice painting, but I've remembered some aspects of it. Or the redesign might also be an object that I've made. I might have taken a photograph or I might do an elaborate oil painting which takes a week to do. Um, and that in a way leaves the world redesigned. So I'm all the time uh, left with these image residues, be they residues in the form of mental images or residues in the forms of Im images that I've made. So this is, if you like, a very dynamic process of making the visual world, of imaging the world. What I've done until now is built a whole lot of parallels between the meaning processes of language and the meaning processes of images. And what I've really been meaning to say, to be quite frank, is that, um, that the processes of imaging involve as much agency, as much making of the world as language does. Um, and, and cognitively, it's, it's as sophisticated, as profound uh, as making language. Um, but also, interestingly, these two modes, uh, written meanings and visual meanings, let's just take written for the moment, leave oral out of it, we'll just contrast those two things, are very, very different from each other. So, you know, I could write a paragraph about the Eiffel Tower, I could describe the Eiffel Tower, I can say a lot of things about the Eiffel Tower in words, and I can take a picture of the Eiffel Tower. So what's different about the two? Well, what we do with reading and writing, we always have to read along the line one thing after the other, but when I present you with an image of the Eiffel Tower, your reading path doesn't, you know, you can't read a paragraph all over the place, but in fact, you can read an image all over the place. You can notice a leaf on the tree, you can notice the branches, you can know, and then after a while, oh, I just noticed it's got that 100-year sign on it. That's interesting, I hadn't noticed that. Whereas another person might spot the 100-year sign first off because, um, because that's unusual, and. It just stuck out to them. So what's interesting is that you see the whole picture all at once, but what it then means is that your reading path is actually very, very different. So what happens in writing is, in a sense, the reader follows the writer, you know, which is you read along the line. If you don't sort of follow the writer along the line, it's going to be, you can't just take random words and hope that it'll work out because it won't. Whereas the viewer really works across the image in their own way. They've got much more space for agency. Huh, maybe this is why we need to go back and thank Jean-Paul Sartre for telling us that this is the basis of imagination and then, and then freedom. I don't know, it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a big one, but it's a nice idea, I quite like that idea. Um, also, because the words go along the line, this and then this and then this and then this and then this, that written meanings are particularly good at representing time and causal connections. Whereas images are particularly good at representing space in one moment of time. So in other words, there's the Eiffel Tower. This photograph was taken on 125th of a second shutter, whatever. Um, there's no movement in it. Um, and it's very good at representing space, spatial relations in one moment of time. So there are a number of really important differences between these two modes. Yes, there are parallels. We're doing Eiffel Towers always, in whether it's in language or in image, but we're doing them in quite different ways. So this then moves us on to the idea of synesthesia which is why is it useful to do these things in more than one way and more than one simultaneous way simultaneously? One of the examples that I really like, which is very much part of our new media experience, is this world of GPS-based maps. So, um, you know, I might have a, a map in, on my phone, in my pocket, um, and 
um, uh, uh, and I'm going from point A to point B. Well, the way I do that is I have a visual representation of the map. I might have a set of directions in words, and also I might have some nice person with a nice synthetic voice saying to me, turn left, turn right, do this, do that. And in fact, the meaning, the map becomes very easy to use because I'm getting it in multiple modes. If one thing doesn't quite make sense visually, there are the words which describe the direction. Somebody's speaking to me as I go. So moving backwards and forwards gives me a more complete meaning because there are limitations in image, there are limitations in writing, there are limitations in speaking, but when those things all happen simultaneously and they're overlaid over each other, uh, that produces a really powerful meaning effect. Can anybody use a printed map anymore? Not really, I can't. I mean, these things, I've just become so dependent on how good they are. I read an article today in the newspaper about um, apps mean that this is an era, an era where people no longer get lost. I mean, you can't get lost if you've got this kind of thing there. And you got lost before because you had limited information. The map wasn't quite enough or whatever. But synesthesia actually has these very practical um, uh, bases because each mode it's talking about space, it's called the map, um, or directionality, let's make it even higher than that. And we've got a visual map, we've got directions, we've got the words, and all those things together uh, mean that we've got a very powerful synesthetic meaning which is helping us navigate the world.